Okay, hello everybody. Uh, let me first check whether everything's working. So we had a kind of introduction last week. Today we are going to look at We're going to <clears throat> uh, look at the uh, teachings of Pao Xiedo and the very first portion of his book, The Workings of Kamma. So maybe we can start with <clears throat> maybe we can start with meditation. So let's take about Let's take about 10 minutes of meditation so that we can sit in a comfortable meditation posture. Make sure your back is erect, side cast down. We'll meditate with opened eyes. And we can make the first determination in our minds voicelessly. From now on, for 10 minutes, I will meditate on muscles and radiate loving kindness without any movement. From now on, for 10 minutes, I will meditate on muscles and radiate loving kindness without any movement. From now on, for 10 minutes, I will meditate on muscles and radiate loving kindness without any movement. And with that determination, we can gently lovingly notice there's a flat piece of sinew at the top of the head. We allow it to be heavy. And changing. Just like at night, you can allow the sun to shine. Even though you don't see it, you have no idea in which direction it is. But still you can allow the sun to shine. You don't try for that, you don't make any effort, you don't help the sun, but still you're able to allow that it is shining. So in the same way, we allow this flat piece of sinew at the top of the head to have some weight and to be changing as we are aging. We don't have to see it. We don't have to feel it. We just allow. We continue in this manner to the forehead. There is a muscle. And again, we allow weight and change in that muscle. Then eyes, nose, lips, chin, cheeks, Ears, back of the head, we allow all of the muscles and flesh, all of the muscles and sinews throughout the head. To be happy and 
and changing. We continue to the neck, shoulders, arms, elbows, forearms, wrists. Palms, fingers, tips of fingers, chest. Abdomen, back, we allow all of the muscles and flesh throughout the upper part of the body to be heavy. And changing. We continue to the buttocks, thighs, knees, calves. Heels, soles, toes, tips of toes. We allow all of the muscles and sinews throughout the body to be heavy and changing. Now, as we allow the body to be the way it is, we achieve freedom from worry about the body. Let's enjoy this freedom. Let's watch this peace.
Now let's share our peace with other living beings in our minds voicelessly. We can allow, we can wish. May all beings, including me, be in peace. May all beings, including me, be in peace. Now, because the time for this sitting is finished, let's make the last determination in our minds, voicelessly. From now on, I will always be calm. From now on, I will always be calm. From now on, I will always be calm. And with that determination, we can slowly, mindfully change the way of our sitting. And when we have changed the way of our sitting, Let's take one more minute during which we will be watching our mind curiously to see what's going on in the mind. Okay, so now we can move on to reading the book. This will be the first time through the system that I'm going to be sharing this book. So let's see up to what extent 
this will be successful. So the system of uh, discussing the book uh, will be uh, based on going through the book together and specifically through some of the portions that I have highlighted. So we will not be really reading the book from the beginning till end. Instead, we will be looking at the portions that uh, I would like to suggest. Uh, to particularly uh, remember and think about. But uh, there are many other points in this book that I have not highlighted. And so you're, of course, most welcome to read the book yourself in full. The book's name is The Workings of Gamma. You will be reading the second revised edition. And... Uh, the author is the Pao Doya Seyado. The publishing year seems to be 2018. All right. So I believe I am now sharing my screen. Let me see. Okay. Um, so what would be the best way? Portion of this book, the clock bound sutta, gaddula baddha sutta. The uh, Buddha in the Sutta is explaining the problem of Kamma and the problem of rebirth. So, first, inconceivable is this beginning because of the round of rebirth. So, we are already here looking at a problem. It is inconceivable. What does that mean? Does that mean that it is inconceivable for the Buddha? Does it mean that it's inconceivable for us? We don't know. In Myanmar, generally, people believe that here inconceivable means related to the Buddha. So the Buddha is not able to see the beginning. But we do not really have any support for that. We don't really know whether the Buddha knows or doesn't know the beginning of the round of rebirth. We only know that the Buddha uh, suggested that this is not something we think about. Even the Buddha suggested that uh, there are four things we are, uh, who we um, will not be successful in, think about, in thinking about either we will get mad or we will be thinking about them until we die and still we will not resolve them. Well, modern science is doing exactly that, thinking about some of these four things. So what are those four things? Is the Buddha, then the jhanas, the concentration of jhanas, then the world, and kamma the way how our actions bring their consequence. So, these are four things that we are not supposed to think about. The Buddha actually specifically discouraged monks from thinking about uh, the world, explaining that monks will simply not be able to find the, the solution. When the Venerable Malum Kyaputta um, approached the Buddha with questions regarding the world, the Buddha explained to Venerable Malum Kyaputta that because Malum Kyaputta 
was became a monk for a different reason than for finding uh, uh, an answer for these particular questions about the world, such as whether the world is finite or infinite. Um, Venerable Malunkya Putta should give these questions up and continue in the proper training of morality, concentration, and insight. So what if an enlightened person asked the Buddha these questions? Well, that would be a very interesting question. Did an enlightened person ask the Buddha these questions? In fact, we have in the scriptures uh, very scarce mentions of uh, enlightened monks discussing this, these points about the world. And one of the, well, there are two, uh, it seems that there are two attitudes uh, generally followed in the scriptures to these 10, there are 10 questions about the world. Uh, now we will simplify whether the world is finite or infinite, but there are eight more which we can discuss later if you ask me for that. So uh, two attitudes from enlightened people. One, this is just a view. It is not something useful. It's not something practical. So this takes us to a very in interesting aspect of Buddhism in the Buddha's time, not so much today, and that's the practicality of the Buddha's teachings. So the Buddha's teachings should be practical, talking about the world is not considered to be practical, and so we don't do it. Very easy. But then there is another point of view of a venerable monk who talks to a layperson who asks this question whether the Buddha, after he passes into Nibbana, whether he exists, not exists, either exists and ex and not, neither, either exists and not exists, neither exists nor non-exists. So these four options, there are four of the 10 questions, so now you already know six. So the Venerable Monk explains that if the body and the mind, if they are impermanent, unsatisfactory, not self, then what could there be already now leading the layperson to understand that already now there is nothing that we could say that exists, that's stable or permanent or lasting or reliable. And if there is nothing that would be stable, reliable, uh, permanent, or in any way existing now, what, uh, what is the value of question whether we exist or not after we go to the full Nibbana? And so he was pointing out to the fact that this question about the Buddha existing or not existing takes this, uh, takes this um, preliminary um, assumption that there is some self in the Buddha. And the question is then, where does this self, this permanent self, get after the Buddha achieves Parinibbana or the full Nibbana? And the answer is, but the Buddha does not have any self during his life. Therefore, the question about what happens with his self after he passes away is off topic. It is out of, uh, it is uh, not, uh, how to say that? It is not reasonable. It is as if I asked you, uh, as if, uh, it is as if I asked you, um, where is your, mother dog now or where is the paper tissue uh, which makes up your heart in the body how does it look like and where will it go after you die well you do not have any paper tissue in your body or i hope so and you surely do not have any dog mother so the question about what will happen with them after you die is totally irrelevant, unreasonable, and very inappropriate. 
for somebody who knows that you don't have them. Okay, so for somebody who does not realize that you don't have them, now of course the question would be a question of a poor person. Oh, this is such a poor person. Now he doesn't know that I have no paper tissue in my body. So he's asking me what will happen with it after I die. Oh, this is such a poor person. He doesn't know that I have no dog mother. Okay, so I'll like compassionately say, okay, you know what? This question is useless. Let's talk about something practical. So this is um, the way how we can look at these questions about the world. And the question about whether there is some beginning and what kind of beginning do all of us have in terms of gamma is on a very similar level because we are looking there at an assumption the assumption that time is linear the buddha did not say whether time is linear or not the Buddha did not say whether it is possible to travel in time or whether there are loopholes or wormholes or whatever else. Uh, but it is not practical. It doesn't get us to any practical result. You could say, well, but if I know how to work with my past, well, then I could do something with my past. But shouldn't you do something with your present at the first place? Now, in the present moment, we have the full power over our mind and the body. We have the full power in terms of being able to be in the present moment. And following this advice of the Buddha to stay in the present moment, we can entirely liberate ourselves from all birth, old age, illness, and death. And we do not need for that any kind of uh, theoretical explanation on how does the world work or doesn't work or what's a problem or what's not a problem with the uh, with the space or gamma and so on so instead we are looking practically in the present moment so the buddha explains inconceivable is the beginning and also it is not suitable to conceive of it a first point is not known of ignorance hindered beings, fettered by craving, rushing on and running about. By who is it not known? The Buddha doesn't tell us. But we can see that the point that the emphasis here is to the craving, rushing on and running about. The word sangsara, which is usually known as uh, the cycle of rebirth actually comes from the words that mean running about. It's running about searching for the builder. It's running about for searching, uh, searching uh, for some eternal self that could satisfy us forever. But because there is no such self, this running about is happening on and on and on for billions and billions of lives and existences in various worlds, various spheres, with various kinds of experience. So there are two main causes for this ongoing process, ignorance and craving. So without ignorance, there is no craving. Without craving, there is no ignorance. The Buddha explains that we should not take even the ignorance as something stable. Ignorance is also conditioned. It is conditioned by the so-called anusayas or asavas is more accurate. It's uh, conditioned by asavas, taints, or uh, we can simplify to mental defilements, greed, hatred, ignorance. A greed, hatred, ignorance feed ignorance, and ignorance feeds greed, hatred, ignorance. So they run about one after another. We cannot therefore say that ignorance is something like self or something stable or something that's in any way a permanent or reliable or, uh, or how to say that, running through. 
with us. No, it doesn't. So ignorance is impermanent, it's changing, it's dependent. Craving is impermanent, changing, dependent. So they're necessary for actions to possess karmic potency. That means that until you have ignorance and craving, there will be the power of your action and the consequence. As soon as you can get rid of all ignorance and craving, all what you do will become functional, kiriya. And being kiriya, functional, it just fulfills its function. It uh, does not um, uh, create any potential for consequence. How does it become functional? It becomes functional simply because there is no ignorance. So all of it then arises based on wisdom, based on faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration and wisdom. The karmic potency, kamma sati, is the potency by which volitional action through body, speech or mind is able to produce a kamma result, kamma vipaka. So uh, this kamma vipaka is also called other moment kamma, nana kanika kamma, because we produce the kamma at one particular uh, consciousness moment. I see now here is an inaccuracy. So other moment kamma actually... Uh, it's not an accurate translation, would be various moments kamma. Okay, nana means various. So it's the kamma that arises through various moments. So there are various moments that make up kamma. And these moments are the mind moments. We'll probably look at them later. The kammic potency produces the result at another moment. So uh, kamma brings about result later as the so-called vipaka or consequence. Nana kanika kamma, therefore, uh, here apparently means that our kamma later brings um, a consequence at a various moment. Could be several kinds of moment, could be happening uh, in various uh, situations. So, for example, killing somebody has uh, the consequence of not only being born in lower realms, in the worlds of suffering, but also it has the consequence of potentially later being born as a human and suffering short life. A clock. So now we get here a little bit of introduction to the name of the sutta. We will get uh, to the point about this clock later in the discourse, uh, but let's look at the, uh, at the text uh, gradually. Now we have uh, here the explanation of what is a clock. It's a block of wood that uh, serves to stop a dog from running. So there is a piece of wood hanging by a strap from the dog's neck, and as the uh, dog would be running, this piece of wood would be beating its legs. And because the dog doesn't want to suffer from uh, this uh, kind of harm, the dog doesn't run and walks instead. Uh, we learn here that it's also used in rural Ma Myanmar. I didn't stay so much in rural Myanmar, but I did, and I have never seen it. So it's probably either rare or only in certain regions. The verb, the verb sangsarati, not sangsarati, sangsarati comes from sang the same way and sarati run on. I would say that sang also means together and uh, it means running on all together throughout all those times. So sangsara would be the uh, the nature of the world, which consists of running away for all of those times that we were running. So we are running away from suffering, but unfortunately, we cannot run away from it in any other way than by following the Eightfold Noble Path. 
So while each volitional formation arises and perishes, its inherent kammik potency, kamma satti, remains in that same mentality, materiality, continuity. So this is an amazing point. This is an amazing point and it's a very problematic point as well. First, the Seattle, I think the, this could be a footnote uh, given by the Seattle. We do not really know who's the author of these footnotes, possibly the teacher himself, because um, uh, they provide such an amazing source of references and information that I, that I believe it's actually coming from the author of this book directly. And um, we learn here that the gamic potency remains in the me mentality, materiality continuity. But how? Where? How does it remain there? If mentality, materiality continuity is consisting of moments, then how does it remain there in those moments? Does it remain in all of those moments? Does it remain in some of those moments? Does it surpass the moments so it actually remains there unchanging while those moments are actually changing? Or does it remain there as sub-moments of the moments? Or does it remain there in, in uh, some cases and sometimes it does not remain there? And how does it enter those moments and how does it leave those moments? We do not get to learn that. But we get to learn it from one Sinhalese master and from one Burmese master. Uh, I'm not exactly sure which Sinhalese master has written this in a book, but I know which Burmese master has written about it. It's from the great master, venerable Nanda Mala Bhivangsa, also known as Pa Chau Siyado. And this uh, so-called Professor Siado or Venerable Nandamala Bhivangsa sub suggests that Kamma is actually maintained in it's actually maintained in the moments of Javana. So our mental strain is supposed to work in some kind of uh, like a regularly fashion um, and we can therefore distinguish segments of the mental process. And these segments usually consist of some kind of existence continuum, which, is, which are moments of mind that just maintain the fact that you're human when you're human. And for example, for an animal, they would maintain the fact that they're animals when they're animals. So then, so there are these moments that maintain the fact that we are this what we are. Then there come the moments of gradual preparation, accepting and dealing with the objects of our senses. So for example, there are these moments that maintain the existence. Then uh, there is some um, potential to be aware of uh, of an object, for example, a visible object by the eye, then uh, there is the contact between the eye and the visible object, then there comes some kind of experience of that object dealing with that object. So when it comes to the javanas, the javanas are the feelings, but also they are uh, the gradual attitude, the gradual um, dealing with those objects. And when we do an action, it is believed by Pacho Siado, by Dr. Nanda Malapivangsa, that these moments of our actions, that our kamma, are maintained in these moments of Javana. But it actually brings us more problems than resolutions. Because with this idea that Javana maintains the, our kamma, we actually get back to the beginning of the question. How does the Kamma maintain itself? So now we know that it's in the Javana moments, but wait, after those Javana moments, there come the Tadaramana, uh, more on that 
possibly later. And then again, bhavanga moments and other moments which are not javanas. And then javanas come later. And then again, moments which are not javanas and then javanas come later. Also, there are times when we are asleep. When we are deep asleep, there actually are no javanas at all. There are only bhavangas. So how does the gamma get maintained during these moments when you do not have javana moments? No answer. So we do not really have any answer on how, do, how does your gamma get maintained as the time goes. My suggestion is that it doesn't have to be maintained. Why would it have to be maintained? Well, the fact that you have learned about things being maintained or being uh, continuous in a certain way doesn't really, man, doesn't really mean that everything must be continuous or that everything must, must be traceable at every moment. It doesn't. The world is the way it is. Whether we understand it or not, whether we like it or not, whether it makes sense to us or not, doesn't really matter to the world. The world will be just the way it is. And so I don't think that we really need to worry about the continuity of our kamma because it is simply there. And um, unfortunately, it's not explained. We do not get that explained in our scriptures. But we do have explained how we can cut off gamma. Then maybe when the gamma is cut off, we can be preoccupied with how does the gamma really move from a moment to a moment. But again, up to my knowledge, uh, there is no such explanation available. All right, so we have done one page. Uh, this book has uh, about um, 400 pages, so we definitely have a lot more to work on. But I believe that uh, I have provided you with a, a pretty good basics on uh, dealing with the problem of gamma, dealing with the problem of problems related to the world, and therefore we can move on to questions. So if you have any questions, if there is anything uh, you would like to ask me regarding the uh, regarding this book, regarding anything else, anything and everything, um, let us know in the chat box. Uh, probably you have some common uh, options in Facebook and in YouTube. So you're most welcome to uh, write down your question or if you have anything you would like to add. To what I've said, now is the best time. Okay, no questions in here. So I think this would be all uh, for today. I think there were four things we had to do, right? Not sure what they are. Let me see. Oh, conclusion. So I don't know how to do conclusion, but um, you of course can join us next week. Uh, everybody is most welcome uh, to join us and um, we will be starting at the same time as today uh, the same day the same time uh, probably the same channel probably the same system and definitely the same book so we'll be continuing onwards to page number two and if you have any questions uh, you can write them down either here in the comments or you can uh, write them for yourself in a notebook so that when we meet again you can share with us 
your question so that I can provide answer and many people can benefit from your question. So thank you everyone for coming. Let me see if there's something more we have to do. Something went wrong, okay. So may you be happy, may you be healthy, and may you be successful in everything you do.